Hi there. My name's Cass Turnbull, and I'm with an organization called Plant Amnesty. Our sole mission is to promote better pruning. And today we're going to be talking about rehabilitative pruning for previously malpruned plants. I'm going to go over the wrong ways to prune, the right ways to prune, and how to fix things if you've made a couple of mistakes. First off, let's talk about the kinds of cuts. There are really only three basic kinds of cuts. There's a heading cut on top, also known as the non-selective heading cut, where you just whack a branch back, hoping that that will make your tree or shrub smaller and maybe force some new growth down below. But that's not what happens. Instead, you stimulate dormant buds to grow out at the tips, and you get all these straight, ugly, skinny shoots called water sprouts. The plant is actually speeding up its growth rate, trying to make up for the lost branches and the lost leaves that it needed. The problem with these water sprouts is that they're ugly, fast-growing, and impossible to get rid of. Your next reaction is just to whack them all again, because obviously it didn't get the message. But instead of stopping the growth, what it does is it splits it. And what happens is you get a whole bunch more sprouts wherever you made the cut. And they just get exponentially worse. Every time you cut it, you get more. You take those off, you get more and more. You take those off, you get more and more and more. This is the most common mistake people make when trying to prune their trees and shrubs. I call this the Hydra effect after the snake that Hercules battled. It was a giant serpent, and when he cut off its head, two grew in its place. And then when he cut those off, four grew back. People make these Hydra monsters in their backyard when they just went out one day to try and make things look the way they used to look back when I liked them. I call this thing a Hydra. The second kind of cut is called the selective heading cut, or we also call it the reduction cut. And this is the right way to make a branch shorter. Uh, you generally do this on your shrubs, not so much on your trees. How you make a branch shorter is you find the longest part that sticks out and bugs you the most up over the window, out over the walkway, and you follow it back to a side branch, to a fork, and you cut it off there. If you do that and the side branch is big enough, you won't get water sprouts and you won't get dieback. Your shrub is briefly shorter. The new growth is forced through existing branches and you get a nice pretty plant. You don't get water sprouts to ruin the good looks of your plant. The third kind of cut is called the thinning cut or a removal cut. Got to have two names for everything. Isn't that the way? With the thinning cut or the removal cut, you're taking the smaller of the two forks off and forcing the new growth through the existing parent stem. This looks an awful lot like the reduction cut, but it's different because it's better on the health of a plant. And the reason we care is that healthy plants are good-looking plants. But please note that this cut never made anything shorter. This is a way to take off the lower branches of a tree or shrub or a whole bunch of these cuts will thin a shrub out so that it's less oppressive and more beautiful. The other thing that can happen when you make a non-selective heading cut is you can cause dieback to the next set of branches or to two buds and leave something we call a stub. This is the first thing that professional gardeners and arborists see when they come to your yard is stubs. When you come to my house, you see dust. I don't see it. But when I come to your yard, I see stubs. And the thing I want to do is cut them all out because that makes things look better and feel better. I mean, plants really don't feel, but they do appreciate the dead wood being removed. It's sort of a health care treatment. When you prune, you don't want to cut too far away, like the upper left-hand corner, because it will just die back, leaving a dead stub, and it will die back to a naturally occurring bulge that exists at the base of branches. This bulge is called the branch collar. 
You don't want to cut into the collar because that would damage the main stem, causing rot to get in there, and we don't want rotten plants. The upper right-hand one shows what happens if you cut into the collar, that little bulge, and inside your shrub or tree is beginning to rot out. The trick is to cut just the branch and not the branch collar, like the lower left-hand corner, and when it's done, you might have a bulge on your main stem, as in the right lower corner, and it will be a bulge when you run your hand across it, but it won't be sharp. It'll be smooth. The longer you prune, the more important good cuts become. I divided plants into three categories as to how we most frequently prune them. Those categories are cane growers, tree likes, and mounding habit shrubs. Don't get hung up on the names of the plants. You might live in a place that's different than I do and have different species, but they all generally divide themselves into these three categories, cane growers, tree likes, and mounds. And we even have some of those things written for the different areas on our website, plantamnesty.org, including Florida, Hawaii, Alaska, Wisconsin. You get the idea. You can learn the species looking them up. And it could be that no matter what climate zone I was in, I would pretty much know how to prune the plants by looking at them. So this is just a beginning point. You need to translate it into your own area species. The cane growers are distinguished by the fact that they have branches that arise from the ground. These branches are called canes, and they don't divide many times. You know, a tree's branch divides evenly into smaller and finer and smaller and finer branches. But a cane grower more looks like, say, a feather, one main stem with little side bits. Also, cane growers have a huge pruning budget. You can take off about a third of the foliage and reduce it by about a quarter of the height. And they are excellent candidates for renovation. We'll talk more about that soon. Just remember, there's nothing you can do to these plants that we can't get them back. The main way that we prune cane growers is you cut them to the ground or to an inch or two above if you're trying to protect your saw from dullness caused by it cutting the dirt. Generally speaking, we take out a few of the biggest, oldest canes, the ones in the middle that are the tallest, and that's a way to shorten your shrub at the same time you thin it out and make it more airy and less crowded. Some of them can also be shortened by making rather large, non-selective looking heading cuts. This is a plant that we have here in the Pacific Northwest, and it gets up over this lady's window, and she complains that it's in the way. I don't get a big pit in my stomach like I would if it was something in the tree-like category. Instead, I cut some of the canes to the ground. I wax some of them off inside. I'm not actually whacking them. I'm cutting them to what's called a node. It looks like a knuckle, and that's where you'll find dormant buds that will grow out. And then I can even head back some of the other branches uh, just back to a leaflet here and there. The main thing is you don't cut it into a cube and you don't cut it into a ball. This way it looks shorter but natural and fluffy all the way through. Second category of shrubs are the mounding habit shrubs. These are just sort of the blobs of the plant world. They're wider than they are tall, and they're just sort of, oh, round. They have small leaves or supple branches. They can be tidied up and made smaller, uh, maybe about a quarter smaller using the reduction cuts. You don't want to spend all day inside of these plants making them into artwork. You just want to get them off the walkway under the window and make them a little less mm, ratty looking. Uh, sometimes these will also have canes that originate from the ground and other times they'll have a more articulate branch structure. We use the time-honored grab-and-snip technique to make them a little bit shorter and tidy up the perimeter. 
What you do is you cast your eyes about and find the branch that sticks out and bugs you the most. You grab it with your left hand and you follow it down inside the plant and cut it off where it either meets the ground or meets a side branch or a parent branch. Then, instead of cutting the branch right next to it, you cast your eyes about, kind of blur your vision, and find the next one that is the worst that bugs you. You grab it with your hand, and then with your other hand, you use your hand pruners to cut it back to a side branch or to a bud. You do this all over the shrub, and miraculously, it's shorter and tidier. You also spend a fair amount of time on the branches touching the ground, this is true for all of the shrubs. And you can take off a whole lot of greenery this way. Your shrub is magically shorter, but it looks natural, and it doesn't matter what time you prune, you'll have blooms. You should memorize that statement. If you're pruning moderately and selectively, it doesn't matter when you prune, you will always have flowers. The third category are trees and tree-like shrubs. Uh, you may have different names for these categories of plants where you live, but they're all comparable. The trees and the tree-like shrubs have an articulate branch structure. It's woody, it's stiff, it divides many times, and, well, these are just sort of the Cadillacs of the plant world. We know that a witch hazel beats a forsythia, and the reason is you have a better branch structure that makes them look naturally tidy and even sometimes elegant. Because of this special branch structure, we have a much smaller pruning budget, say an eighth of the foliage. Uh, the one-third rule is for shrubs, not for trees and tree-like shrubs. You also want to make generally smaller cuts and the vast majority will be removal cuts. Occasionally you do a selective heading cut, but not very often. Whenever you can, you wanna avoid size restraint. Why? Why do you wanna avoid size restraint? Well, any number of things can go wrong. The first thing that can go wrong is you can get water sprouts, which as we know are impossible to get rid of. Uh, the other thing is you can start to make it look wonky that's another technical term from the laboratories at Plant Amnesty. And in the case of trees, you can make things dangerous. This is an example of the kinds of cuts that you might use on a tree or a tree-like shrub. You take the lowest branches off that are touching the ground. You can see a little tiny stub in the lower right-hand corner. That counts for 90% of all the cuts, which are deadwood cuts. You take out the deadwood first. You do it always. After that, there are branches that you look at, crossing rubbing branches, parallel branches. Sometimes uh, a branch in one part of the shrub or tree will dip too far down into the layer below it, and it will look better if that is removed. And you'll notice that there's a series of choices. I can tell when my students are getting selective pruning when they start arguing with me. They say things like, I would have taken the other branch. You're not going to leave that, are you? And that's because there are no exact right branches. There's just a series of choices. The trick to thinning is every space is filled but with less stuff. Here's an example of thinning out a tree-like shrub. Number one, the dotted lines stand for deadwood. You can always take the deadwood out. It doesn't count against the pruning budget. All trees and shrubs have their own budget, whether you can take a lot or a little out, and the size of the cuts you can use. Too bad it's not posted. After you take the deadwood out, you might want to open up the center. In point two, you can see that my illustrator has located one big branch that's kind of clogging up the center. She takes that out, and then it looks thinner. And then three, she sees a whole lot of smaller branches, not necessarily ones that are crossing and rubbing, but just filling up space. 
and she takes those out, and now you have a thinner shrub. It's not stripped out with just branches at the tips, but it's thin all over. And this is, just for a point of reference, heavy thinning. Some shrubs take heavy thinning, some trees take heavy thinning, and others don't. The trick to the ones that don't take heavy thinning is to prune lightly and put up with a lot that's wrong, lest you create water sprouts. This is the only time I've ever caught thinning on film. This is a weeping willow. There are three guys in it that are going to prune it out. This is the after picture. Notice there's one guy way over on the left just finishing cleaning that up. Once again, this is the before. Looks kind of dirty and messy. The after looks clean and beautiful. My mentor, Andrea, said a shrub should look as good in the winter as it does in the summer. Until then, deciduous things just disappeared for me, but now I judge their branch structure and how nice it looks in the winter. So that is how to prune the three major forms of shrubs and trees.